Hi everybody, welcome back to the thrift cast. It has been a while since I posted a thrift cast video. Um, these are a lot of fun for me because I get to answer some of your questions, talk to you about my flip of the week, my flop of the week, and catch you up on some of the things that are happening in my personal life. So this week I posted on Instagram and I got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, Lumpy is at the groomers right now, so I found myself with this little window of opportunity to film. It's so strange to me not having slow fashion Friday happen this week. Slow Fashion Friday has been so good for me. I don't even know where to begin. It has really changed my life and my perspective on things. For those of you who don't know, um, Slow Fashion Friday, I started in August. I posted a video on August 4th titled, Are Resellers Over Consumers? And I was filled with emotion when I filled that, filmed that video because I really felt like I was just buried by my inventory, buried by my to-do list, buried by the clutter in my house and I realized I was on an unsustainable path as far as my happiness went like I, I feel like because I have a YouTube channel and I do love thrifting and it is my business I could justify any purchase I would thrift more than I needed to I would buy more than I needed to and even with Tina who is my assistant I feel like we were just maintaining like we had caught up on a lot of our death pile things but I was never really getting ahead about four or five years ago now, I started Thriftless February. So in Thriftless February, I would set a goal for myself where I would work on stuff that needed to be done in my business. Death piles, delisting and relisting items, maybe sprucing up some titles, all the back of house stuff that's not really fun with reselling. And it was really a successful thing for me, which is why I do it every year, but I realized one month out of the year was just not enough for me. And so I had this idea that I would replace one thrifting day a week with one day of decluttering my home and my business. I remember when I started this, I set some goals for myself and they were things like, you know, donate 10 items a week or delist and relist five items. I had like this number that I thought was going to work. Also, I wanted to get my inventory to under a thousand. So while I have felt very successful and fulfilled and more at peace about so many things, my inventory is higher than ever, which is just a testament to how many things I have hanging around my house because I'm thrifting at least 50% less than I was prior to starting Slow Fashion Friday. The combination of losing my dad turning 50 and my son Rocco has now been in college for a year and almost a half. So we're empty nesters and my Lulu passed away in February. It was bad. So I really felt like I needed something to change in order to move forward and heal and letting go of some of my stuff was a way to do that. I don't want to rehash everything because I talked about it at length in that video. This would have been week 13. I took this week off and it feels very strange to not be, you know, tackling some project and filming and editing on this Friday. I had a lot of time this week to go for walks and journal and just, it's been a really peaceful week for me. I'm enjoying the space I'm in so much more um, and realizing just how little I need and looking at the things that actually make me happy. So thank you to everyone who's been on this journey with me. I think I'll probably touch on more of this later in the thrift cast, but let's just get started with the flip of the week. This sale may have come in um, like maybe two weeks ago, but it's my best sale in a while because sales have been slower. It's been much more of a hustle and a grind these past few months. But I sold this beautiful tunic from a brand I had never heard of. I'm going to mispronounce this, Zhang Toy. Z-A-N-G-T-O-I. I found this beautiful tunic at a designer thrift store that is no longer in business. They, they closed this one branch. It was like an outlet for a consignment store and I went twice. And this is the store that I went in and everything was $5 and everything was designer. I was like a kid in a candy shop. If I could go back to one thrifting situation, it would be that. But the store has since closed. I picked this up not knowing the brand. It was this royal blue silk tunic and it was just gorgeous. It is a very niche designer brand. I think I had it put aside to send to the real real because I didn't think it was something that would sell for very much money for me or I figured it would sit for a long time. So this was something when we cleaned out the basement and we were going through Tina's table area and just all the clutter in the basement, I had a bin of things 
slated to send to the real reel, which I don't really use the real reel anymore. I might revisit it, but I just feel like the payouts were so low and I wasn't creating time to consistently send things to them and get to know their structure, which has changed quite a bit. So we decided to either donate some of these items or list them. It probably sold in a month or two, but I got a $153 offer and I quickly accepted that. Um, the buyer paid $7.99 for shipping. That was one of the biggest sales I've had in a while. And I was really happy about that because it was such a low cost of goods. The actual largest sale that I've had is on a fountain pen that I bought myself. I literally broke even on it, but it was a limited edition collaboration between two fountain pen companies, Esterbrook and Ferris Wheel Press. It was a first First time collaboration between these two. It was just a little too bright for me. I think I paid $365 for it. It sold for $400, but that was no profit. Sometimes the highest priced items, depending on what you pay for, they may not be your most profitable flip, but that was the highest price, but um, I barely broke even on that one. Okay, now for the flop of the week, and this one's a doozy. I honestly think this was like a new low for me as a reseller. And it's a good thing it happened with my best friend. Okay, I'm gonna paint the picture here. As you know, I'm liquidating all of my American Girl stuff. And I have some super valuable American Girl pieces that are retired and in mint condition. And then I have very played with stuff. Anyway, I had this Bitty Baby doll. I listed it for maybe $20, $25. Bitty Baby brand new, I believe is $60. It was in an off-brand dress. So I had it listed. I sent out offers through Paul Chevier for 40% off. And this ended up selling for $17 with discounted shipping. So not a big sale. The thing with this Bitty Baby is that we had just listed it. It was nowhere. It was not in tote scan. It was not in Vendu. Tina, was honestly losing her mind. Somewhere back in my terrible memory subconscious, I was like, you know, I think I may have given this doll to my friend Marguerite, who is one of my best friends who has a granddaughter named Stella. I go, I don't know what makes me think it, but the only thing I could think of is that I gave this to Marguerite and then I deleted it, deleted the listing from Vendu. It didn't exist anywhere. So after hours of franticness, I texted Marguerite. I'm like, Marguerite, did I give you a bitty baby doll for Stella and some stuff because we can't find it anywhere and it's sold and she laughed and she wrote lol yes you gave me that and she told me all the things that I had given her and all of a sudden the light bulb like I remember it like it was clear as day like it had just happened I'm like oh my gosh Tina we have located the doll. So I said to her, oh my gosh, is it Stella's favorite thing? I'll just cancel the order. It was only $17. I'll make it up to my buyer. And she's like, no, she really doesn't play with it all that much. I'm like, all that much? I will buy her a new bitty baby doll. So I'm, I'm making all these promises with Marguerite. So I go to pick it up on Halloween, which happens to be her granddaughter's birthday. So I'm gonna show you how it went down when I went to pick it up at Marguerite's house. I am sad to admit that I have really hit a new low as a reseller <laughs> and it's kind of funny but it's true and and this is this is about as low as it gets. So I'm at my girlfriend Marguerite's house. Do you want the dress or anything? I think I need everything, the pink dress and everything. I literally gave her an American Girl doll for her granddaughter and I thought I delisted it and I deleted it from Vendu, but I didn't actually delist it and of course it's sold. So now I'm here to take a bitty baby doll away from a two-year-old. I've, I've literally hit a new low. <laughs> Is this who you're looking for? Oh wait, oh, she can keep the pink, she can keep that outfit. Oh, let's see what you're taking away from my two-year-old daughter, my granddaughter, <laughs> on her birthday. Today's Stella's second birthday. I'm coming back with toys. <laughs> all right, I just need- There's Basket I need, shoes? Nope, I just need, oh, now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> giving you this. Okay, I just need this dress okay. and this doll. This is my granddaughter, but say goodbye to the doll, Ivy. Oh, give her a little hug. Oh, you're breaking my heart. She's gonna go home to Lori and then Lori's gonna send it to another family. <laughs> we have secured the doll. <laughs> Marguerite, that, to really add insult to the fact that I'm taking this on your granddaughter's birthday is she sold for $17. <laughs> I would have paid you 30. <laughs> This is when you know you have a really excellent friend. It was actually comical, the hoops that I jumped through for this $17 with discounted shipping sale. I actually, um, magic erased her head. She had a few scuffs, so she actually looked better than the pictures showed her. I sent her off 
in her outfit that she was sold in. I am currently finding the perfect doll in my 100 plus doll collection for Marguerite's granddaughter. So not only did I take a doll away from a baby, a two-year-old, but I took it away on her second birthday. So yes, this was a new low for me as a reseller. And Tina and I always say, if we could just have like a cam on us with some of the things that we say or the comments people make, enough of that because that was quite a flop. Let's go to some Q&A. Thank God Marguerite is such a good sport. Sandra Z asked, what is your best thrift find? I've talked about this before and I wanna mention it because it has to do with my friend Marguerite. Marguerite and I were shopping at Savers. She walked around the corner and she had hanging over her head. You know, you can take the hanger and put it over you so like the dress is in front of you. She walked over and she's like, what do you think of this dress on me? And it was a gunny sacks dress. Mint, mint, beautiful condition. Like a crispy, crispy tag like it had never been used and it was $4. I about passed out. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, like, cause she has a daughter, Alana, who's beautiful and tall and would actually look stunning in that dress. And I said, um, really calmly, like, are, are you giving that, is that for you, for Alana? She's like, no, Alana will never wear it, it's for you. And I'm like, oh my God, I like freaked out. $4, I listed it for $7.50, I believe, on eBay. I've sold four gunny sacks dresses. This was the highest profit. And it ended up selling for $600 on eBay, that was my highest profit flip. I think I've had sales that are higher than that, but not for such a low investment. So that was my biggest profit, best flip, and super exciting, and I didn't even find it. So thank God for good friends. I need my readers for some of these names. Linda Camps, Fitness for Health, asks, how much does Lumpy weigh? I would say Lumpy is about 18 to 20 pounds right now. He's nine months old today. Is it November 3rd? He's nine months old today. He was born on February 3rd. So they say they're full grown by about nine months. Is that true? He's a cockapoo. He'll probably have a one year checkup. He also has to be neutered. Um, we're probably gonna do that at about one year. So we'll probably get a uh, weight on him then. He is a little nugget. I love him so much. People ask me often, like, what breed is he? He's Cocker Spaniel and Poodle, as were Lucky and Lulu, but he definitely looks more Cocker Spaniel, acts more Cocker Spaniel. He's a nut. Somebody also asked where I got him. I got him at a place in Lemonster, Mass. Ricochet Kitty asked, do you find that certain sizes sell better? Most of my answers are unscientific. If you, if you know me, you know that but I would say definitely larger sizes sell better for me. Although, as far as jeans go, jeans are a little bit more measurable for me visually, which I'm kind of a visual learner because we put our jeans in bins according to size. It's the only category that we inventory according to size because so many jeans look the same. We just put them according to size. There was a time where like my 31s and 32s that that bin was empty or on its way to empty. So I was always buying larger size jeans. Now that bin is kind of overflowing and what's selling really well are like the 27, 28 and 29s. Like that has been a really hot seller. I would say that those size jeans have been selling better than the 31s or is it just because I bought so many? Certain brands I think sell better in larger sizes. I have the assumption that more mature brands sell better in larger sizes. So things like Chico's and J. Jill and Talbot's, like I'm usually happier when I find those brands in larger sizes. I feel like the thrift stores are overflowing with smaller sizes. So if you can find something in a large or extra large size, you can do really well. I also find that if I find athletic wear in size tall, that does well for me typically, like Athleta, Lululemon, if you can find something in a tall, it may sit a little bit longer, but there's less on the market, so sometimes that does a little bit better. I go for larger sizes. I don't know if it's just because like I'm a mid-size frame. Great question. Lily Rivas asks, your favorite pricing strategy, what prices, how and why I need help, thanks. <laughs> That's a good question and I do have some favorite pricing. Um, I would say my two most common prices is $38 and $44. I think $30 to $35 is my sweet spot. I could sell like $30 items all day long. I don't love selling things between $20 and $25 because I do pay Tina to photograph stuff. Like I have 
extra overhead because I have an employee. I don't want to be selling the majority of my items under $30 because for me, for it to be worth it, I really like above 30. So 30 to $40 I think is my sweet spot. And I am also typically sending out 20% off offers right off the bat, unless it's a brand, brand new item or unless brand new, meaning fresh to my closet, or it's an item that's super popular and I'm not going to like take the first offer that comes in. But if I price something at $38 and I do discounted shipping, 20% brings it down to $30 and then I'll do $5.95 shipping on Poshmark. If I price something at $44, 20% is $35 with discounted shipping. And then if I price something at $50, 20% is 40. So 50, 44, 38, those are pretty common price points for me. It just works for me. Like I used to price a lot of things at $45 just because it was a round number. And then when I would do 20% off, it would bring it to 36. Sometimes I want to do 4.99 shipping. So it's like a rounded number. It would go over the $40. Does that make sense? I don't know. Those are just numbers that I have kind of settled on. I'll do 25 a lot too. Discounted 20% is $20. So 25, 38, 44, 50. Those are pretty popular in my in my brand. What are your favorite brands to wear? Who asked this? The Littlest Light Bulb Thrift asked that question. Funny enough, as much as I love brands and think about brands, I don't always shop by brands because when I'm in thrift stores, I buy what I think is cute. Like this top I picked up, I'm going to sell this. It's coming out in a haul next week. I think this brand is called Mustard Seed. I think this is a really cute top, but I don't necessarily shop by brands because I'm thrifting all the time. So I just get things that I think look good on me. But when I really think about the brands that I wear on a daily basis, definitely Lululemon. And it's not because I work out. It's because they make great athleisure. And because I'm thrifting and I'm home, I like to be comfortable. I like to be able to run out and take lumpy for a walk. The ones I'm wearing right now, they are thrifted. I got them at the bins. They are jacked up. They're pilly. <laughs> They're not pretty at all, but they're comfortable. I've actually put these in the donate pile and pulled them out. The Lululemon Groove Pant is what I lived in, you know, about 15 years ago. And I have since replaced my old Groove Pants with a new one. They have a little bit of a flare at the bottom, but the ones that I got recently, they're just thinner. I don't know if they're more the Align fabric, but they don't hold me in. And I like, I need a little sucky any fabric, you know what I mean? So I live in my Lululemons. My shirts vary. I'm more of a category shopper than I am a brand shopper. Like you all know, I love in the summer, I love all of my kimono style and caftans. My uniform is usually a tank top, leggings, and then a caftan or a tank top, jeans, and a cardigan sweater. Like I love that little cover up. I wear all sorts of cardigan sweaters. I wear all sorts of um, caftans in the summer and there's usually like a base layer that has a little compression to hold me in. That's my uniform. Oh, and I did also say that I love my New Balance 327 sneakers. I find when I wake up in the morning, if I put my sneakers on my feet, I am hands down more productive in my day. I am more likely to walk further with lumpy than if I'm just sliding on like my Birkenstocks. I'll get more steps in and I love the look of my New Balance 327s. I have them on right now. There they are <laughs> with my black socks. Such a fashionista. I'm probably gonna get a new pair for Christmas because these are getting like a little beat up. Shonda Pants asks, tell us about your basement pinball machine. This is a fun question. We have a vintage pin bought pinball machine that is covered with junk. That is like the last section of the basement that I have to clean besides the back room. That's going to be like, I think all of winter. That's going to be what I'm working on the back room and my personal closet. Those are like the final frontiers of, of um, Slow Fashion Friday. We grew up in the 80s. Jay was born in 72. I was born in 73. So 1980, we were like seven and eight years old. And the 80s were kind of our childhood memories. And Pinbot is a pinball machine from that era. And my husband is not a big collector. He is not a stuff guy, but he wanted a vintage pinball machine. And we found one. There is a network. There's a network for everything. I love the subcultures that you can find in 2023. Um, but Jay found like a list of available vintage pinball machines, where they were located, who had them for sale, what they were charging. And we ended up renting a U-Haul. Oh my gosh, this was one of my craziest memories. And actually my dad was a big part of it. And 
it was like one of our biggest regrets. We drove to get this pinball machine in the middle of a snowstorm. And we were in Boston the night before, I think, for one of Jay's holiday parties. And then we drove to get the pinball machine. We rented a U-Haul. We had to get the pinball machine. I mean, and it's old and it's glass and it's heavy. Oh my God, such a nightmare. We have to pull it in the back of our house because it's going into our basement. And my dad came over to help us. And it was Jay and my dad on like this, you know, like when you have the ramps that go off the back of a truck in the snow. Maybe my dad was 70, 68, too old to be on the back of this U-Haul walking down this plank with the pinball machine in a snowstorm. Jay and I, like to this day, Jay's like, that was the stupidest thing we ever did. We should have hired movers. Cause at one point somebody slipped and I thought my dad was gonna lose his footing. My dad was a big, strong guy, but I was like, oh my gosh, the visions. Anyway, we secured the pinball machine. It's in our basement. Jay's actually thinking about selling it, which makes me sad. We also have a Pac-Man machine, a Miss Pac-Man machine that was in Jay's house growing up. That's gonna stay in the family. We might give Miss Pac-Man to Jay's sister who has two young boys right now because you know our kids are out of the house. We don't use it as much. And as far as pinball goes, there was a huge rise in popularity for pinball machines when Stranger Things came out. The value of his pinball machine has gone up. I think if he sold it today, he would make about $1,000 on it. It's kind of finicky. It works great, but we've had to replace a couple things. I don't know. I don't know. That's like Jay's world. But when the kids were young, Rocco's friends especially, they loved playing with the pinball machine. It's definitely an investment piece because it keeps going up in value. I just don't want anything to happen to it. It horrifies me that I have like inventory on top and below that pinball machine. It's embarrassing because it's such a cool piece. Jay is so easygoing. I would probably be so mad if I were him. Anyways, that's the pinball machine story. ESM78978 asks, how often do you delist, relist on Poshmark and eBay? And then someone else, JP Marsh 63 said, do you delist and relist your inventory on Vendu Game Changer for me this week? Congratulations. So delisting and relisting is something that I'm doing more now that I'm thrifting less. I think it's the number one way to not spend money and revive your closet. So on Vendu, when you delist an item and relist it, it shows up as a new item. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that items every 30 days on eBay get relisted, but they're still stale. So they like end and start over, but they're not technically new listings. They're still just kind of recycled listings. So until you actually close that out and then relist it as a new listing, it's still stale. So what I started to do, which people have been doing forever, um, is going into eBay, and I think if you don't have Vendu, you end the listing and then sell similar and you're basically relisting it. Um, but on Vendu, I just do delist and relist. It's amazing when I do that, when I go into eBay, I talked about this in one of my recent Slow Fashion Friday videos. When I went in, I found items that had sold on Poshmark. I found items that were misspelled. I found items that were marked with the wrong size, items that I probably priced five years ago that needed to be dropped in price. Like it is a wealth of information and you can really get to know your inventory better by delisting and relisting. It's like having a cluttered closet in your own house. If you're not going through your closet to see what you actually have, you may go out and buy a shirt that you already own. And I think the same is true for inventory. Like it really is good for me to look and see what I have because right now I have 1800 live items on Poshmark, which I think was another question. I think I have 1205 active listings on eBay. If you guys know for years, I was trying to get to a thousand listings on eBay and eBay is really becoming more and more neck and neck with Poshmark. It used to be that when I listed items, I wouldn't list everything to eBay. Still to this day, if it's a really bulky item or it seems like it's going to be hard to ship or it's super heavy, I just don't want to deal with eBay. So I sometimes still won't list things over there, but the gap is definitely closing between how many items I have listed on Poshmark versus eBay and the gap is also closing between what I'm selling on both both platforms and I cannot wait for the day for eBay to surpass 
Poshmark because I know it's gonna happen one of these days. I don't list the same amount of items every day, so one day I'll go into eBay when it says items ending today. If you go into my eBay and to selling, you can see what's ending on a certain day. Some days I only have five items that are ending, some days I have none, some days I have 25 items that are ending. So I don't always get to it every day, but every time I do it, it just makes me feel so good and I feel like I'm one step closer to having a better inventory system. Okay, Groovy Mom of Three asks, read anything good lately? Well, one of the benefits of not having so much clutter around or just mental real estate taken up in my head is I do have a little bit more time to read. So I just started reading The Little Paris Bookshop. When I was going through my books, as you know, that was one of my Slow Fashion Friday videos, I got rid of over 300 books from our basement and it was a process. That was so satisfying to see the before and after. And this book, for whatever reason, I didn't wanna get rid of this. I didn't know where it came from. So I have it upstairs and I started reading it a couple nights ago and um, Jay saw it and he's like, oh my gosh, I read that book. So this must've been Jay's Book. So it's The Little Paris Bookshop by Nina George. And this was also one of Oprah's books. It's about a shop owner who um, recommends books to all of the people who come into his shop. He's really good at, you know, they say mending broken hearts and helping people heal through books. Um, but he actually is very sad about something in his own life. I'm only a couple chapters in, but the love of his life disappears and she leaves him a letter. So it's a little bit of a mystery because he heads off to the south of France to find his lost love. It says, The Little Paris Bookshop is a love letter to books meant for anyone who believes in the power of stories to shape people's lives. So. I'm not that far in, but so far so good. In the book before this, I read The Silent Wife um, with my little book club with my girlfriends, but I'm not a huge reader. But it was funny that I got this question because I, I just grabbed this book a few days ago and the question came in yesterday. Clothes I Sell 2 asks, what are the benefits of Posher VA uh, versus the drawbacks? Thank you. I honestly can't think of any drawbacks, but I, I think there are things that people use Posher VA for that I just don't use them for because I also use Vendu. I use Posher VA, which is a bot that helps you share your closet. I use it strictly for sharing my closet and sending out bulk offers. I think they have a D-list, relist feature, but I don't mess with it because I think it messes with Vendu. Um, so I do everything through Vendu, but Vendu does not offer sharing. They don't offer bulk offers yet. So that's what I use. Posture VA for whenever I say that I ran a sale in my Poshmark closet, you can go in and specify the percentage off you want to offer. You can specify if you want to include new with tag items or exclude them. And you can specify, and this is one of the things I love the most, is how old the inventory is that you're sending the offers out on. So oftentimes, I like to do 40% off. I'll do 50% off too, but I usually start with 40%. And then I'll say anything that's over X amount of days, depending on how generous I'm feeling. Usually I'll do 100 days. I don't mind holding on to things for a while, but I think by three months, you know, I'm sure I've already sent 20, 30% off offers. If nobody's bit on those, I can offer the 40%. And then every once in a while, I'll do 50% off. I often do exclude new with tag items because sometimes my new with tag items, I've purchased retail arbitrage and I don't wanna lose money on those things. So it's really great. And I'll offer like maybe two sales a month, sometimes three, sometimes one. I'm not very systematic about things, but you can see what a spike it is in my business. And I feel like if I didn't run those sales in, on Poshmark through Posher VA, I think that things would be really flat. I have never run a sale in eBay. I'm just generally more uncomfortable with eBay, so I keep it very minimal over there. Maybe over time, as that becomes more and more of a presence in my business, I will tinker with that a little bit, but I don't send coupons over there. I don't run sales over there, and it's just because it's like fear of the unknown. I do have a lot of balls in the air, and I just have to pick and choose what I'm like a pro at and I'm not a pro at eBay. Trisha Marie one asks, has Poshmark been slower than usual for you this September, October? Absolutely yes, 100% yes. I've been listing more and my sales have not really matched my effort. For me, I don't know if it's because I'm listing so much American Girl stuff or I'm listing stuff around my house. 
So maybe the items I'm listing aren't as desirable, which is why I need to keep thrifting and finding new things, even though I'm also working on, you know, not having so much stuff. I still have to thrift. I'm just trying to thrift better, but definitely slower for me. Rumster Posh asks, how many hours do you spend on average thrifting now versus overall time spent on business? Um, I had to write this down because I felt like I could have gone off for like 20 minutes on this question. This is my general breakdown. And since I got this question, I really want to start tracking it. I mean, I am big into journaling and writing and planning, and I think this would be really helpful information for me to just actually realize how much time I spend working in a week. I will say that the days that Tina is here, I tend to work very long days, like super productive, because I want to make the most of the time spent while Tina is here. So for an example, when Tina comes on a Monday, she's usually here on Mondays, I will try to print all the labels from weekend sales before she gets here because she likes to do shipping. Sometimes I'll pull items before she gets here if I have time. Sometimes I will just print labels and then we'll pull some together or she'll pull them and I'll get packaging ready or whatever, some combination of that. There are also days, if it's not a big shipping day, that she's gonna come and she's gonna photograph things from a recent haul video. So there are many days where I'll wake up, shower, put makeup on, and I will film a haul before Tina gets here at 9.30. So that's like an hour or two before she even gets here. Then she's here for six hours. Mostly I edit when Tina's here because it's a time that I know I have someone in the house so I'm gonna sit and focus and edit as opposed to being tempted to not sit and edit when nobody's here. So I'll often edit a video. I usually put videos out on either a Monday or Tuesday and Slow Fashion Friday. That's kind of been my rhythm these days. And then when Tina leaves, if I have a video that's going live, which I typically do on a Monday or a Tuesday, I'll spend an additional three or four hours editing and then the video will go live. And she's usually here two days a week. So two days a week, I would say I put in most of my hours for the entire week when Tina's here. So I may work like 10 to 12 hour days when Tina's here. And again, I work from home. So there's walks down the street, there's lunch breaks, there's scrolling on Instagram, there's journaling. Like, so it's not like nose to the grindstone for 12 hours in a day, but I put in longer days on the days that Tina's here. I'll probably thrift like four to six hours a week. Sometimes I'll thrift once a week, sometimes twice, sometimes no time if I've thrifted three times the week before. I'm trying to stagger my thrift videos rather than put them all out at once. It's just helping me plan a little better. If I go to the bins with Kim, which I typically do like once every three weeks, maybe once a month, that's more of a commitment. We'll leave my house at like eight or nine and I won't get back until two. Um, so that's more like just a four hour thrift trip just while we're there, but it's also an hour and a half in the car of driving. So those days are a little bit longer. When I go to my local savers, I can usually hit savers and be back within three hours, like 15 minutes there, two hours in store, maybe two and a half, 15 minute back, 15 minutes back. Filming is four to six hours too. And then I said, or up to eight, to 10 hours because I also have a second channel. I've been trying to do at least one video a week on time with Tata. So filming takes about two hours depending because like I'll have to set up the camera and then like shooting right now, I'm looking, I'm at 52 minutes. This is gonna be a very long video. Not all of my videos are this long. And then when I do thrift with me's, I take all of the photos and videos from my phone and I get it all set in the queue on iMovie to get ready to edit. So filming's like four to six hours a week. And sometimes when Lumpy's here, I just have a ton of interruptions, so it takes longer. Editing takes a long time for me. Um, because my videos tend to be longer, I try to go in there and cut out my ums and my ands because every little bit helps. I'm not one of these 15 minute video people. I wish I was. I would, it would be so much easier for me if I didn't have such long videos because it does take a lot of time to edit my videos. So I would say I, I spend about 10 to 15 15 hours a week editing, shipping about four to six hours. When Tina's here, she does a lot of it, but she's only here twice a week. So that means there are four or five other days that I'm shipping between pulling stuff, printing the labels, packaging everything up, all that takes some time. So I estimate about four to six hours. And then I estimate between like seven and 10 hours a week of just sending offers, responding to comments, 
doing listings. Tina also helps me with listings, but there are a lot of days that I'm doing listings at night or I'll go in and remove the backgrounds and add details. And that's a lot of time that I probably should measure better because that's time when I'm on the couch and I'm doing a little bit of editing, a little bit of comments, a little bit of listing. You know, that is time that I probably should tighten up a little bit. So all of that equals over 40 hours a week. But as you can see, because I have Tina for 12 to 14 hours a week, um, I'm spending most of my time on thrifting and the, the YouTube portion. And then somebody also asked me, I, I don't remember who it was, but they asked me, oh, Lumpy is ready for pickup. See you soon. <laughs> okay, we'll go see Lumpy soon. Tina Miss Demina, that's a fun name, asked, I have a question about Tina. Do you pay her by the listing or by the hour? I love your channel. Thank you so much. I pay Tina by the hour. I don't think that that is the way everybody should pay their people, but Tina does more than just listing for me. She does shipping for me, she does photographing, she does inventory, she packages stuff, so it just wouldn't work for our model. Um, I suppose that work that she does at home, because sometimes she will do list, make listings go live. I pay Tina 30 to 40% more than I paid my high school student because she is just one of the hardest working people I know. I honestly don't know what I would do without Tina. Because she is so passionate about organization and efficiency, my goal, I always say this, is to just let her run operations. If I could have a business where I literally come in, film my video, and hand it to Tina, and then that's the last I see of it, that would be like the ultimate for me. Tina's amazing, and I still wanna get her in a thrift cast to answer some questions because I think we'd have a lot of fun with Tina and with Kim. Leah Romero said, you made a sale. But the time to prepare to ship, but it's time to prepare to ship and you end up finding a flaw. What do you do? This happened to me so many times. Um, what I will do is take a picture of the item, send a message to my buyer. You can go in and message your buyer if something hasn't shipped and there is a spot for you to put a picture in. So I will say, hi Susie, I am so sorry. I was just packaging this up and I noticed that there's a flaw that we missed and it was not disclosed in the listing. And I'll give them the option to cancel. If it's a really big flaw, they'll probably cancel. I remember there were a pair of Birkenstocks that I think the cork was um, separating and I didn't realize it. And I was freaking out because it was, it was a decent sale. And I messaged my buyer, I think this is the way it went. And they said, um, oh gosh, no worries. I'm having them resold. I just wanted them for the leather. And I was like, oh, Okay, like she's like, they're coming apart anyways. And I couldn't believe that. So that was that was great. Just be honest, that's the best thing you can do. I've oftentimes had people say, thank you so much for taking time to look things over before you ship them out. So I think people do appreciate it. One of the things I commonly do if I make a mistake and my buyer decides to keep it is I'll say, is there something else you would like for $20 or less that I can include in the order with them and then I can just delete the listing? Or I'll say, please accept 40% off or pick a number, um, your next purchase or something like that. Like just, just make it work. Communicate work until your buyer is happy and in some cases they wanna cancel. And it's my bad, but it's good to catch it before it leaves than when it's already out the door, so. Okay, some of these questions just came in. Um, how did you decide on Lumpy's name? I think it's so adorable, the best dog name ever. Oh, that's so funny. I've mentioned this before, but Lumpy in the 70s and 80s was my dad's nickname. He used to play darts in the basement. His friends would come over and they would play darts, and he had like an electric dart board that he made and wired it all up. It was like this whole thing. And he had a t-shirt and it was said Lumpy's Lounge. So he was nicknamed Lumpy. For whatever reason, we've just named our dogs L Dogs. We had Lucky Mario, we had Lulu Marie, and then we had Lumpy. And I think my friend Marguerite said his middle name should be Ma Marciano, Lumpy Marciano, because they've all had like Italian mid middle names. His middle name hasn't really caught on, but we got the name because of my dad. And when my dad was really sick, I told him that we were gonna name our puppy Lumpy. And I was able to show my dad pictures and that was one of the things I wanted to do was bring my dad to meet the puppy. All these questions get to me sometimes, you know? <laughs> my mom's like, I just want to have one day where I don't cry. She's like, just one day. <laughs> I'm like, I know, mom, it's hard. So I never know when people are tuning in, so I, never, I don't want to repeat myself so much, but Lulu died on February 2nd, pretty unexpectedly. 
in the middle of my dad being so sick and then my dad died March 15th, but Lumpy was born on February 3rd. So I always thought he was meant to be ours because he was literally born the day after Lulu died. I didn't know that until I called the place where we got Lulu and they said they had a litter and I said, you know, I'm looking for, um, I wanted like a rust color or like a khaki color. They had Lumpy. He was one of like maybe two or three dogs in the litter that weren't spoken for. And I knew I wanted to name my dog Lumpy. So I thought that should probably belong to a boy. And there was, oh, it was Lumpy and like one other girl. And I think the girl was like buff or black or something like that. So Lumpy, Lumpy was the one. So he was named after my dad. For, I remember someone said, why would you name a beautiful little puppy such a weird thing, Lumpy? And if you knew him, it's like, it so suits him. At first I was like, do I really want to name my dog? lumpy but it made my dad smile and it is such a perfect name for that little monkey um, I'm excited to see him this was lumpy on Halloween by the way he's obsessed with lamb chop so I got him a lamb chop costume at Target he, it didn't last very long but this one cracks me up this picture because <laughs> it looks like he's walking oh my gosh so funny he's a nut so that question just came in and made me cry and there's one other one that I know is gonna make me sad. Okay, Mother Knows Best Vintage on the heels of this. I follow this account and I know that this wonderful woman is, is a caregiver right now for her dad. And her question says, how do you balance being a wife, mom, reseller, YouTuber while also dealing with grief? Um, that is a really good question and for me, staying busy really helped me. I remember like almost feeling guilty going thrifting or posting videos when my dad was really sick, but this is what keeps me going. Like life moves on and you have to move forward or you'll just be stuck. That's at least that's how I felt. So just, just keep swimming <laughs> like Dory. So I think one of the things is just going with whatever you're feeling. Like there were days where I didn't want to film and there were days when I absolutely had to film to keep my mind off things. But I think that staying busy really helped me. And the, the way that I am able to do everything that I do is that I have incredible people around me that help me. I have Tina. I don't know how I got so lucky. She actually called me because we worked together at American Girl for almost eight years. Um, so that has been a really wonderful fit. Um, and also my husband's really helpful. I think having help has always been key for me. When my kids were little, my mom helped out a lot. I think one of the ways I'm able to do all this now too is that my kids aren't home. There's no way I could keep the schedule that I keep now with filming and thrifting and YouTube and all that stuff if my kids were little. I don't know how like young moms do it. Like Amber Resells is a YouTuber, eBayer, and an actuary. She also has another job and a mom um, to little Rena and Mogi Beth has a young girl and I, I and she just found out she's pregnant like I don't know how people in the community do it with young kids so I think that I just have the gift of a little extra time but I think as far as the grief goes I think for me um, take the time when you need it and work when you need to can only speak for myself I, I have the most incredible support system. I have really, really good girlfriends. I have great family. I have a great job. I have a great community here. You guys actually helped me so much. So many text messages from people and just people checking in. I was amazed at my friends who are so thoughtful. And I remember thinking, I remember wanting to apologize to people when they went through the loss of a parent or loved one. And I felt like I wasn't there for them as much. And all I, all I can think of now is you just don't know until you go through it. It's like having kids, like nobody can explain to you what it's like to have children until you actually have kids and you haven't slept in days and just your whole world changes. But it's similar to that, like it, until you go through it, it's hard to know and grief is different for everybody. But for me, my support system was really important and the fact that I had a job that I really loved and this could actually be a distraction for me. Um, and I tried to work my job into some of the caregiving. Like I remember that's when I bought my first backpack that I used all the time because I would bring it to Dana Farber because my mom wasn't comfortable driving in the city. So in the beginning I was driving my dad in and I would just bring my laptop and work while he went in for a treatment or PET scan or something like that. There was a fair amount of juggling, but anyway, I hope that helps. That, that's a great question and I'm thinking of you and I hope, I hope everything's going okay for you.
I know caregiving, and I wasn't the main caregiver. My mom was. She had the, the most of it on her. Butterfly Emporium asks, what is your favorite thing about Lumpy? I love all the Lumpy questions. Oh my gosh. Um, he's really funny. I think he's like a bull in a china shop. Jay always says he's coming in hot because like when he loves, he is like, he's not at all, like it, Lulu Marie was so dainty. She was such a girl and Lucky was a love, but he was kind of an oaf. He was not as secure. He wasn't as confident as Lumpy. Lumpy has all this confidence, but he just like, he, he doesn't know boundaries. Like he, when he loves, he like runs in hard and everything he does is 150%. And it just makes me laugh a lot. He has such a huge personality and I just love, I, I love seeing puppies experience things for the first time. Like when we walked down the street the other day, uh, all the leaves are starting to fall and he kept like walking three feet and he'd pee on the leaves to like mark his territory. But I could see it was like, fascinated by the leaves or a leaf would fall and he would like run across the street to get it so it's it's so neat to see a puppy see things for the first time and what's really nice about lumpy is because i'm an empty nester I, he gets so much extra time with me than the other dogs have had i think that he's on the best schedule he sleeps through the night the other two i don't even know how he got through the days with two puppies and three kids i have i have no idea what the other dogs even did but lumpy is just i i know him so well because it's it's just the three of us so that that's been really fun it's hard to say just one thing i love him i love the color of him as much as my other dogs i love them so much obviously but moving forward, I was like, you know, I'd like to get a dog with a different color. So I love his coat. It's so cute. He's so cute. He's going to look so cute when I pick him up. Um, Sarah Dara 29 says, how do you like Noom? I just signed up and would love to see what you eat in a day. And I meant to do this one earlier. Um, I just got like back into Noom. I did do a full video on Noom on my second channel. But the gist of it is Noom is a program where every day you weigh yourself, you write down what you eat and you read for like five to seven minutes, like very digestible little things about healthy eating. I say this should be nudge because I feel like this is not an in your face diet. It kind of nudges you to make good decisions. And I went on Noom probably this time last year. I don't even remember when, but I lost like 14 to 16 pounds. And what's crazy to me is I went off of Noom. Um, I don't know, maybe during the summer. I feel like we lost it when the kids came home in May and I never really went back on it until we just went back on like five days ago, not even. But I'm in the zone right now, so this question was good timing. But the crazy thing for me is I only gained about four, maybe five pounds back in like seven months time. And I have never done that before. I've lost over 25 to 30 pounds on Weight Watchers. I've had real success with different programs, but never have I gone off the diet where I wasn't recording stuff, where I maintained anything. I always gained it back and usually then some. So I had only gained about five pounds back of the, I don't, what did I actually lose? I'm trying to think of what my lowest was. I think I lost 16 pounds in total. And when I stepped on the scale the other day, I was up about five pounds from the lowest. So I, I've, I kept 12 pounds off, which is crazy to me. And I think it's just because it helps you shift your way of thinking and you never feel guilty about food. No food is off limits. It's not a hardcore diet. It's just like you have to stay in it. Like writing things down is really helpful for me. Weighing myself every day is really helpful. And I know people think it's not good. For me, it's really, really helpful. It just keeps me honest and reading a little bit just keeps it on your mind. It's not anything crazy, it's just scientific information that they're sharing with you and strategies to help you be successful. What I eat in a day varies every day, but there are some basics that I eat during the day. My dinner is what's the most different every day, but if I'm in the zone with Noom, I'm eating a lot of hard boiled eggs that I love to pickle. I love to put my hard boiled eggs in vinegar. It may sound weird to you, but I love it. I love salty things, so I love doing that. Um, I also get these chomps. They're like Slim Jims, for lack of a better word. <laughs> they're, but they're free range turkey. They're 60 calories. So those are a great snack on the go. I live near like three apple orchards in my town. So literally an apple a day, I sometimes two, and I like to cut my apples up. That helps me stay on track. I eat the Chobani um, Zero Sugar yogurt and one of my favorite things to do and it's super filling is i will take the yogurt and i will also do some oatmeal and um, sometimes i'll cook my own oatmeal just quick oats uh, recently 
Pumpkin spice oatmeal was 99 cents at my grocery store. I think they were liquidating all of their pumpkin stuff. So I bought two boxes and it's 160 calories, a lot of sugar, not the best for me, but it's 160 calories and then my yogurt is 60 calories. And then I take frozen cherries and I do about three quarters of a cup of the frozen cherries with the 60 calorie yogurt. And then I put the oatmeal on top and it's so filling. And you have green food, yellow food, and orange food. Green is basically eat as much as you want. Yellow is eat in moderation. And the, the orange food is like, you know, if I have a, if I had a Kit Kat bar on Halloween or something like that, it's your oils and your fats and your, you know, the stuff you're supposed to use sparingly. Not the pumpkin spice, but regular oatmeal and cherries and yogurt are all green items. So I will eat those almost every day. Sometimes I'll have that for lunch. Sometimes I'll have it for dinner. Sometimes I'll have it for breakfast, but those are the things that keep me on track. There's also a Noom chili recipe that is so simple. Actually, I'm going to do a reel about it because I just made it last night. It's two cans of Hormel chili, which sounds so gross, but we get the vegetarian one. I never thought I would eat Hormel chili because I make my own chili, but it's two cans, two cans of Rotel, and then three peppers. We do a green, an orange, and a yellow, and an onion, and it's big and bulky and so good, and it's a ton of vegetables, and it's like a green food, so we'll try to make that chili once a week. Um, but I basically eat those things during the day. We do Dave's Killer Bread, 70 calories, veggies, pickles, that sort of things. So that those are the foods that I eat mostly during the day, and then my dinner, you know, sometimes I'll have a glass of wine, we'll go out. Jay is much more um, rigid and he loses weight much faster than I do, but I really love Noom. So, and I think I do have a discount code. If I find it, I'll put it in the, um, in the description. Okay. Last question. Do you itemize your cost of goods? How do you bookkeep? Um, I do itemize my cost of goods. I find that even if I go on a shopping trip and my average cost of goods is like say six or $7, I do like to itemize them as best I can because Sometimes I will buy something and maybe I'm spending $9 on it in store. And if that doesn't sell for a good profit, I don't want to think of it as something that costs $6 or $5 if that was my average cost of goods. I want to know that that particular item cost whatever it did cost. A lot of people don't do it this way. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. I personally like to itemize my cost of goods, but it's not a perfect science. Okay, I promise that was going to be a quick one. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. That was really fun. And I'll be back next week with another Slow Fashion Friday video. If you like today's video, be sure to like and subscribe. I will see you soon. Um, I have a great haul for you coming up next. And yeah, I'll be back next week with Slow Fashion Friday. And I'll try to get Thriftcast in again before uh, Thanksgiving or before Christmas. All right, thanks everybody. I love you. Bye. Get your hair cut today. I love when I can see your handsome eyes. Oh, you want to go see your meme? Are you so excited to see meme?